Welcome everyone to our uh, challenge, Circular Economy Challenge, um, hosted by uh, Windsor um, Essex Chapter PO and University of Windsor. Uh, it's arranged part of the National Engineering Month. We have land acknowledgement here. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many diverse nations. Windsor sits on the traditional territory of the three fires confederacy of First Nations, which includes Ojibwe, Odewe, and Potawatomi. We respect the long-standing relationships with First Nations people in this place in the 100 mile Windsor-Essex Peninsula and the uh, Detroit area. The agenda is a welcome and introduction. Uh, we have uh, then the circular economy explained, then a guest speaker, and we'll start with the student presentations and judging. And after that, we open the discussion. Uh, uh, at the meantime, the judges can go to the breakout room and discuss the results of the, the challenge. And then feedback from guest speaker and judges, uh, questions and answers, and then concluding remarks. Uh, we have now uh, the judges here, Dan Castellain, uh, Akash Pachi, and uh, Sean McCain. I'll let them introduce themselves. We'll start with Dan. Okay, uh, I'm Dan Castlin. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, graduated from the University of Windsor in 1981. I've been working at the university now for 33, 34 years as a project manager. Um, and I've been involved with the PEO now for about five, six years. Uh, so, and this is uh, glad to be here to help out to uh, encourage this kind of uh, promotion and, and current in, in awareness of engineering and engineering uh, practices. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Akash uh, Bachi, if you can uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Akash Bhakchi, as Maha mentioned. I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. I work as a water resources engineer with a consulting firm called Dillon Consulting uh, in Windsor. Um, I, I, I got my PA about three years ago and I've been uh, volunteering with the local PEO chapter ever since then. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. And um, if, uh, finally, uh, Sean, would like to uh, introduce yourself, please. Thanks, Maha. Thank so um, I've got a little bit of a weird career, but that's okay. Uh, geological and civil engineering, both from the University of Windsor. Uh, I've had the chance to work in research and development, construction and materials, general contracting, um, consulting engineering, all kinds of different stuff. But Presently, I deal with uh, technology uh, focused on research and development of, of clients that are doing different types of interesting uh, R&D in Canada, but as well as in the United States. So I deal with what's a, a program called the Scientific Research and Experimental Development Program. Uh, but I work for myself, but I have worked for lots of different companies, including a small, small accounting firm called Deloitte, which is not very small. Uh, but enjoy writing and meeting lots of clients that are doing interesting things around North America. Thanks, Maha. Thank you, Sean. I, I, I finished my bachelor degree in 1999, then worked in, uh, back home uh, in a power plant, water treatment department, managed the water treatment department, then uh, uh, was promoted to be a health and safety uh, engineer. And then when I arrived to Canada, started studying, I got my uh, uh, sustainable development certificate from Ryerson, then I uh, started uh, uh, the process of getting my license. Um, and so I'm now an uh, engineer in training. I uh, got my degree, my, then pursued my master's degree in uh, industrial engineering. The focus was on circular economy, uh, where I met uh, our speaker uh, here, Mr. Lawrence. So next, we will go for a small, um, uh, a brief explanation. What's circular economy?
So Talk of sustainability is everywhere today, and along with it, a growing awareness of the linear model of our existing economy. This linear economic model is captured in the popular description of the economy as a process of take, make, and dispose. We take natural resources from our environment, produce a product, and push it out to end users who then dispose of it. This used to not be such a problem. However, as the economy has grown and reached planetary limits, inputs are appearing more limited and outputs have become increasingly detrimental to ecosystems. To give us some appreciation for just how inefficient this overall linear model is, the Rocky Mountain Institute estimated in the year 2000 that the flow of natural materials globally is 500 billion tons per year, but only 1% is put into durable products and still there six months later. The other 99% is waste. As limits are increasingly met, the emphasis is now shifting from an economic model that is organized around gross throughput of material and energy in a linear fashion to a new kind of circular economy which shifts the focus to the internal organization of processes within which resources are used. It aims to optimize for the overall service delivered rather than the gross throughput of products. The circular economy is all about identifying and closing loops so as to create self-sustaining systems where producers and consumers are closely coupled to enable constant feedback. For example, food production, consumption, and disposal might be organized to be part of the same closed cycle. To do this, industries are studied as industrial ecologies so as to identify where and how resources and energy flow through them where they are lost, and where processes could be interconnected to reduce those losses. In a circular system, resource input and waste, emission, and energy leakage are minimized by slowing, closing, and narrowing energy and material loops. This can be achieved through long-lasting design, maintenance, repair, reuse, remanufacturing, refurbishing, or recycling. This is a regenerative approach where things are being constantly repurposed to serve new functions. The challenge of achieving a sustainable form of development is shifting the emphasis from discrete one-off products to looking increasingly at how they can evolve through their full life cycle. This is a fundamental switch in paradigm from designing systems that are inherently degenerative to systems that are inherently regenerative over time. Developing a truly circular economy requires diversity and the interconnecting of different systems. Systems and processes that are all the same consume the same resources and produce the same outputs without the capacity to recycle them. It is only by connecting different systems in the right way that we can harness their diversity to create synergies between them. The circular economy shifts the locus from things to the synergies between them. Our existing linear economy is a product of analytical thinking, where we divide everything up and separate everything out so as to focus on specific activities and achieve economies of scale. We put housing all in the residential area, factories in the industrial zone, food production and farms, etc. In contrast, the circular economy is about integration so as to enable feedback loops and synergies. As Gunter Pauli notes, it is about using the resources available in cascading systems. The waste of one product becomes the input to create a new cash flow. Things in this circular model become multifunctional. Instead of a building just serving a housing function, it becomes also an energy producer and consumer, a food producer and consumer. It may function as entertainment and recreation. This multifunctionality works to not just close loops, but also create more resilient systems because they are more self-sufficient and less dependent. As the circular economy is not about any individual product or thing, it is rather about changing the organization of whole systems, it requires systems thinking. As the Ellen MacArthur Foundation notes, the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It is about all of the interconnected companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. Uh, thank you for watching the video. 
Now we will uh, introduce our speaker, our speaker, Mr. Lawrence Basner. Uh, he's the owner, founder of Basner uh, Environmental uh, LCD, owner, founder of Can Am Recycling, 25 employees, broker, and processing more than 1.5 million pounds of plastic per month of globally ship shipping various products. Industry leader in automotive plastic recycling market with Southwestern Ontario. Proud to be born and raised in Windsor area. 46 years experience in recycling industry, starting from family business. University of Windsor education, BA economics, B commerce and industrial relations and finance, MBA. Mr. Lawrence, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I thought what I would do is, is just uh, speak for a, a few minutes and then go into uh, discussion and questions. Um, so um, I, I, I may repeat a little bit of my introduction, but I started in the uh, scrap metal business. My family had been in the scrap metal business since 1952 in Windsor. Uh, so I grew up in Windsor, worked in the family business from the time I was eight, uh, went to the University of Windsor, uh, did a degree in economics and uh, graduated in 89, uh, did a commerce degree in 92, um, I, I worked for two years for BFI in the waste management business. So I had, I had my background in, uh, in recycling. Then I had uh, some <clears throat> exposure to the waste management industry. And um, I left BFI in 96 and started my own company and went back to, to start my MBA. I actually didn't finish my MBA because the business uh, sort of uh, took off. And, uh, you know, I figured I'd always come back to it one day and, so far, I haven't. Um, uh, coming out of the plastic recycler, coming out of the scrap metal business, being a mature industry, I found that you know everybody had already been recycling metal because you know there was nobody throwing out metal in, in the eighties and nineties and seventies and sixties. Um, <clears throat> however, as as I started finding more customers who were, I was handling their scrap metal. And they said, you know, it's great you're doing my scrap metal, but, you know, what can you do with all of this? And they were showing me all this plastic. And the plastic recycling is a newer, was a newer industry. And, uh, and there were people who were still landfilling plastics. Uh, uh, plenty of it. Um, in fact, one, of the com one company, DuPont, that was manufacturing nylon uh, was landfilling their scraps and their purgings and their off-spec and you know, all the, the drools and, and, and that type of uh, thing. Um, years later, when nylon became valuable, they were actually companies, uh, there was a company up near Ottawa, and they had actually gone back to the landfills and were digging it back up. And, you know, again, I, I don't want to uh, state anything, in, you know, that you may know or, or don't know, but being having a couple years experience in the waste management business, landfills are pretty... Um, sophisticated, uh, engineered uh, treatment places, right? They don't uh, just, it's not just a hole, dig it, bury it. So if you could actually go back and say, show me the trash that was put here in February of 1974, and they will know exactly in what cell that that is. So they were able to go back and dig up the nylon when it had that much more value that had been landfilled years and years earlier. Uh, anyway, so when I got back into the, into the plastics business, it was a newer industry. This is 20, 25 years ago. Uh, there were people recycling it, but it wasn't mainstream. And the emphasis on recycling wasn't like it is today. <clears throat> so uh, the plastics part of our business started growing far more significantly than the scrap metal business. And you know, the scrap metal business would grow 10, 15% a year the plastics business was doubling. So after a couple of years, we really decided to focus on plastics and, uh, and, and we totally shifted into a plastic recycling company. Um, uh, and, and now of course the plastics business is newer, but I wouldn't say it's in its infancy, but it's still not nearly the mature industry that scrap right. metal um, is. <clears throat> and as a result, there's new technologies that are constantly being uh, developed for um, sorting, separating, processing, 
um, washing, repelletizing, recompounding. Those are all relatively new technologies and there's always newer technologies coming out to make it better so that they can take um, recycled plastic and make it back to a repro, which is just slightly off a virgin product, which of course uses oil and natural gas to make monomers and then the monomers to make polymers. And that's how the virgin uh, plastic works. But again, circular economy to if you can reuse plastic, um, it's going to be uh, better for the environment. Uh, <clears throat> now the, the economic side of that is that when virgin plastics are cheap, which they really relatively recently have been, I mean, they go through cycles, but back, especially, you know, a year ago when the pandemic hit, there was very little demand for virgin plastics because all the plants worldwide, which, you know, had never happened before, had, had, had shut. So all these producers had so much material on hand. And of course the demand is nil. So <clears throat> prices of virgin material had dropped so, so, so low that three months later when the economy started to recover, virgin pricing was still cheap. So what did that do for plastic recycling, for, uh, you know, for plastic recycling? Well, if, and just gonna use some numbers, but if virgin polypropylene is selling at 40 cents a pound, then someone who's gonna wanna use a recycled polypropylene wants to buy it for less than 40 cents. But by the time it's collected, ground, reprocessed, compounded, and delivered back to the customer, it's hard to do it less than 40. So the, so the, the prices of, of the recycled material um, was, is, you know, is, 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 is low. However, now here we are, and I'm sure you all know what's going on with, with the supply chains and polypropylene has more than doubled in price in the last three or four months. And the demand and, can, and you can't even get it regardless of the price. So the demand for scrap plastics has just shot up in the last three or four months, as well as the pricing. So obviously plastics have to be economically viable to be recycled, um, which sometimes they're more viable than others. Um, but just wanted to uh, sort of do a couple of differentiations. One of them is in 1907 is when they invented something called Bakelite. I'm not sure if anyone knows what Bakelite is, but Bakelite was, well, a few people might remember. Remember the telephones, you know, the, the, the like the, the pick up, hang up. Okay, that was Bakelite. That stuff was almost indestructible. That was the very first plastic. Um, it's actually called polyoxabenzylmethylglycancholinhydride. Uh, I wouldn't remember that, so I did write it down. But um, <clears throat> Bakelite, Bakelite is what's called a thermoset plastic. So a thermoset is sort of like as it heats up, it hardens, and then it's set. It will not, it, it isn't recyclable. It's almost like an epoxy. Two liquids come together, they harden, that's it. It's one shot, it's done over. Um, that's a thermoset. Later on, they, they started to invent what are called thermoplastics, which are recyclable. So it's a polymer. It's melted down, it's molded into a part. That part's no good, or it's been used, or it's old. It can be reground, remolded, reground, remolded. And, and so thermoplastics are far more popular now than thermosets. Thermosets are, there's not that many uh, around, but they st there still are, and there's still companies using them, which, my, you know, the, when I knew these were, this was an engineering theme, um, there's several uh, areas where the engineering that's still going into some of these products, um, they're engineered to not be recyclable, like a thermal set. Um, um, certain parts, because they might be a low volume, they don't warrant making a mold, designing the mold, and then going through the injection pro injection mold process to make a plastic, they'll just say, well, we'll make it out of a thermoset. One shot, done. If the part's no good, it can't be recycled. So in some respects, it might be more costly up front to have made that mold and done it with a thermoplastic that could be recycled. But from the engineering perspective, they're still choosing 
to design, design parts made out of materials that aren't recyclable. Um, and the other part uh, of, of it, and again, I just, I was gonna to touch on this later, but the other part of, of where engineering comes in to prohibit or promote recyclability is um, sometimes they'll make a part, like your dash, your dash, for example, on your car. If you reach out and touch your dash, it kind of looks like it's grainy. It's called a skin. And it's usually made out of TPO or PVC. And all that is recyclable, both PVC and, and, and TPOs. But underneath, they, they put a foam on it, like just, just a foam for cushion. Well, sometimes they'll use a TPO skin with a polypropylene foam. And that's fully recyclable because they're both compatible materials. But if, and there's sometimes where they'll make the TPO skin and they'll put a PVC foam underneath. That makes the material not recyclable. So going back from the engineering stage, if they would design it so that they, they, the, the materials that go into it are compatible with each other, it would promote recyclability. For some reason, and, and I really don't know the reason, uh, maybe it's cost, <clears throat> when they design a part and they put two very non-compatible parts to it, it makes it, uh, it prohibits that part from being recycled. Um, um, the other area that I think is um, important to differentiate uh, when talking about, you know, everyone says, well, plastics, plastic recycling is a sham and plastic recycling is fake and it can't be recycled and all that. Um, I, I, I think you have to look closer at the plastic recycling uh, streams and markets. So there's obviously everybody's familiar with post-industrial and post-consumer, right? Post-consumer plastics would be plastics that have already been used. Your margarine container you put to the curb, your empty Tide bottle. Um, those, those are all post-consumer. Uh, They've already been through the consumer. Post-industrial would be that margarine container when that container was made at the factory before margarine ever went into it. That's the, the same product, but it's, it's post-industrial. Um, and then there's post-commercial, which is... Um, you know, if, if you're shipping things on skids um, and you shrink wrap it and you, you know, that, that shrink wrap is sort of a post-commercial. It's after the, it's been through its commerce use, but it hasn't really gone through the consumer use. <clears throat> so having said all that, post-consumer plastics often, when, when, again, when prices were high and they're getting there again, the plastics that everybody's been giving a bad rap to that aren't getting recycled are now going to again uh, reach a stage where there's more economic viability in recycling some of those plastics. Um, you know, they're talking now about banning bags at the grocery store. Oh, they have for a long time and California did a long time ago. You know, that material is all recyclable. The cost to collect it, sort it, bail it, process it and recycle it might be cost prohibitive, but the material itself is very recyclable. Um, and when you think about it, most things that you're gonna put into that bag, your tomatoes that are gonna be wrapped, your clam shells, your containers, it's all plastic and it's all single use plastic. So some single use plastics are not recyclable uh, only for the simple reason that that they're cost prohibitive. The material is, is recyclable unless it's a thermal set, which is pretty rare. But the cost uh, is the cost to, to process it and collect it and recycle it is cost prohibitive. Um, so the economic sustainability and viability is going to uh, is going to be the, the, the big factor in whether or not plastics are recyclable. Um, I wanted to touch on one other. Um, really sort of major influence in the last almost 10 years in recyclability. And that is, so So in my business, we do automotive recycling. So all the parts that are made for cars, in most cases, these parts have, in almost all cases, these parts that we recycle have never been on a car. They're molded. And if they're molded wrong or poorly or short shot, uh, they're scrapped out. Sometimes they're molded fine but 
then they go to get painted. And during the paint process, something goes wrong, they're scrapped out. Uh, sometimes they go to get assembled and somebody scratches it. So there's all different stages along the process where the parts can get scrapped out. And that is, again, all post industrial recycling. That, that value in those materials, plus some of them are very high valued materials, things like ABS, PC ABS, ASA, PCASA, nylons, acrylics, polycarbonates. Those are all pretty high valued uh, plastics. Um, so they certainly are economically viable and economically sustainable to recycle, um, you know, by themselves. Very different than, you know, your Tide container and your, your margarine tub and your straw and your plastic fork and all those items. Um, you know, very different economic models. Um, but, but going back, one, one of the big factors was the collection and of, of all the post industry of all the post uh, consumer plastics um, used to be baled and China, which is an incredibly large country with a ton of people and a growing economy, but they're resource negative. They don't have their own mining. They don't have a lot of their own resources. So where do they have to get the resources? Well, they have to get the resources from other countries, waste, um, and, and they have to import the materials to be recycled. Now, they also generate a lot of materials, but ultimately the, the bulk of that material has to come from um, you know, other countries. Canada and the US were big. We used to ship um, probably 15 to 20 containers a month right into Guangdong, China. In 2013, um, they implemented a, uh, 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 an operation called the Green Fence, where what was happening was um, they did not have the same environmental regulation. I heard, you know, you're talking about uh, uh, wastewater, uh, Akash. You know, they don't have the same regulations in discharge, both for the water, for the air, for the land, and a lot of material that was that was going through the recycle process was um, contaminating their environment, um, air, land, water. And for some reason, rather than implementing tighter environmental regulations and restrictions, they decided we're not going to import um, pl scrap plastics. So they put, what well, I'm sorry, they put tighter restrictions on the plastics that they would import. Now we continued to import, export to China at that point because our material was not really waste. It was post-industrial plastics to begin with, not post-consumer. So it was pretty clean. Um, however, in 2018, they then implemented something called the National Sword where they banned most plastics from coming into the country as well as um, at the time, a lot of cardboard as well. So what did that do? Well, that created, you know, basically like a proverbial sucking sound because here was a country that really, really needs all this resource, but it, it can't come into the country. So all of the plastic recyclers in China um, went and set up different um, facilities in Indonesia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Korea, Vietnam, and currently we still ship 10, 10, 12, 15 containers a month to those countries. And, and we ship to India, we ship to Indonesia, we ship to Malaysia, uh, we ship to Korea. And what most of these facilities do now is they bring in the materials, same stuff we used to ship directly into China. It then gets pre-processed into a, um, a reprocessed pellet which is now a clean, usable material. And that material ultimately still goes right direct into China. It's just that now it, it has a, uh, an intermediary destination that, uh, that, that can take it in and, and process it. Um, so, so that was a big factor. But what, also, what that also did was all these, you see all the you know, marketplace and 60 Minutes and they all do these exposés on plastic recycling and plastic recycling is a scam and a sham and all that. 
And really they're talking about the post consumer bales of, you know, they call them one to sevens because it's got all the plastics from one to seven. Um, and, and, and that stuff ultimately had a difficult time finding homes. Um, but again, you know, with technology trying to catch up saying, okay, well, we, we need to find a way to cost effectively sort process, reprocess and reuse. They are all recyclable plastics. It's just whether or not they're economically viable. So, uh, and, and then, as I said, you know, with the recovery now coming out of the pandemic, it's been a very, um, uh, very, in 25 years, I've, I've never seen a market like this. Plastic prices are going up um, exponentially and the demand is insatiable and the supply is tight. And now with the, you know, the ship in the Suez Canal and the microchip shortage and the, and the assembly plants being shut down. And because a lot of, and, and one more factor, a lot of customers, this was just happened this week, but a lot of my volumes from my, my, my suppliers have tightened up because they can't get raw material. So now they're saying, you know what, I'm going to try to reuse, instead of giving you my scrap or selling you my scrap, I'm going to do everything I can do to try to reuse it because I can't get virgin materials. So a lot of customers now are, are trying to reuse and, and they're scrambling to find a, a way to reuse it uh, with good results. Because when you're reintroducing a recycled material, if it's the quality is not there, um, you're just going to end up with larger scrap rates. So, um, so th those are the things that the scrap industry is going through right now. So I know some of this was a little bit more off of the engineering uh, topic, but uh, those were some of the ideas and comments I wanted to kind of throw out there and uh, certainly uh, look, look forward to any response. Yeah, that, that's that's cool, Lawrence. Really appreciate that background. And what I think we should do is let's get into the, the students project because it's, it's a, a novel idea. And what I'd like you to do while the judges step out to a breakout room is talk to the students and inspire them a little bit more based on what you've been doing in the industry because what they're trying to do is something similar, but with with a different product, of course. Um, and uh, this is really focused on trying to inspire students. This whole this whole activity that we're doing here, this whole event. So, um, if you don't mind, let's move into that part, and then we can get into some question and answer because that's really where where the interaction. That's where everybody's going to learn even more. So this is super. Um, are you are you there? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ge Haoyu. Uh, Lin Wang and uh, Zhang Tianyi is my teammates. Uh, today we are talking about the recycle economy. <clears throat> you can see the picture, that's a can, right? Uh, in 1959, can was invited. It does not just change the way we sell in water, it brings convenience to our people's life. Well, today we are going to reinvent the cans and we are going to intro, intro, introduce one product, the can phonograph. So before we get into it, uh, let me just uh, talk about uh, cans first. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure in this room, everyone has bought uh, can products, and I'm also sure when you buy uh, bought the cans, you just focus on the beverage in the can. You uh, when you drink the beverage, you just uh, enjoy the Coke, right? Everyone like like Coke, but no one cares about the can itself. Uh, sorry. So today, let's go back to 1959 when the phonograph was invited. Oh, sorry. You can see this picture. This picture obviously is a uh, recycled cans in developed countries, which have a uh, good recycle systems, according to the. Uh, resource recycle systems. 
aluminum cans have a really high recycling rate, which is 96%. But today, we want to increase this rate and improve the efficiency of the recycling systems. Also, the can cans pollution is a global problem. We still can find in developing countries, they still do, we, these countries do not have a great recycle system or they do not even have a recycle system. Let's see these pictures. In these pictures, they do not have a recycle system. So at that place, what should we do? And how we help them to recycle the cans or help them to improve, to support their life. Our project, we choose music. We want people in these pictures to hear the music from all over the world. And let people who do not have electricity experience the diversity of the world to feel the power from the music and improve their spiritual life. I, I hope uh, this has given you a little bit of uh, interest of our project. Now, let's go back to 1896 uh, when the phonograph was invited. This, uh, you can see the picture on the left side this is a phonograph invited by Edison. At that time, people still do not have electricity. People convert sound waves into vibrating of a mat metal needle. And uh, they use the metal needles to engrave the sound waves on a wax cylinder. At the record turns, the growth makes the needle vibrate back and forth. That makes the creating songs. Uh, let's see a short video about how that works. Uh, sorry, can you still, uh, still see, see, see my screen? No, again, maybe you have to stop sharing and then select uh, Oh, okay. Select. Uh, oh, I think that's. Yep, there you go. You got yeah. it. Yep. Although there's no sound. <laughs> Uh, so you can see the video, this phonograph uh, can play the music without the electricity. And our plan is use the cans to replace the wax cylinder. When the factories manufacture pop cans, the machine will bring different music on the, sur on the surface of pop cans. That means when you buy a pop cans in a store, you can see the growth on the scan, but you don't know which music is it. If you want to know the music, uh, you can keep the empty cans back to home and keep it. Uh, you can see the picture on the right side. That is a wax cylinder. You can see it's really similar to a can. But about the other part of, about the gramophone, you, know, you can see just the video. The factories doesn't need to, to make the other part of uh, gramophone. Oh, uh, sorry, you can see th this one. The factories and the web, the cans and the web cylinder is really similar. Factories only need to cut uh, the grave on the cans. 
then we can replace the wax cylinder. And factories do not to or, uh, make other parts of the phonograph because other things is very easy to replace and easy to build. Let's see what we can do to build a gramophone. A pen is necessary and a cup or a paper cup. A cup. Uh, let's see my uh, mo model, sorry, just with a minute. Now I want to introduce how our gramophone works. First, you need to get a can and uh, a cup which you can use. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I, oh, okay, okay. Now I want to introduce how our gramophone works. First, you need to get a can and uh, a cup, which you can use plastic cup or what a uh, paper cup. And a pen, which you just need the top part of the pen. And you need a box and a chopsticks, which you can actually you can use other things like wood or plastic to build this part. I you can see I just uh, use some waste to build that. I just want to show in developing countries just like Africa, people still can build this one. And now we put this nails is just to uh, put a force on this top so that can make sure the needle can touch the groove. Now you can see the gramophone almost done. When, when you turn uh, turns the record, the sound will come. Now we use another way to see that. Okay, we can show it the other side. Now you can see the pen will touch the girl and now we turn the record as the record turns the girl makes the needle vibrate back and forth these vibrations are transmitted to the bottom of the cup which is self vibrate and that creates a song now we can see uh, we can listen the sound comes out maybe this cup you can hear you look you know you love me i know you can i know you stare and now you can turn and change another cup maybe this one you will hear i wonder how I wonder why yesterday I see a blue, 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 blue sky. Oh, never I can see just a lemon tree. And this.
Oh uh, hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I, I just found I'm I'm a terrible singer. Uh, I think you can figure out. Uh, actually, my gramophone doesn't make sound because I find it's little difficult to cut grooves uh, on the cans. So I find another video to prove why our model can work, and we use the same material, same width. So. Let's see another video. Uh, in his video, he tried to record his voice, but our plan is just to play the voice. The machine will cut the groove on the cans, so our music will play very clear. Uh, even you have a damage on the can surface, it still doesn't matter because you know, when you listen to music, you just miss one second or two seconds, it doesn't matter. Now, this is our plan and think about that. We can see this picture on the right side. That is uh, air conditioning in Africa because they do not have electricity. As that in the developing countries, they do, they do not have Wi-Fi, they do not have phones. But our project, uh, they, they, it's difficult for them to know the world, but our cans is a new way for them to learn about the world. This is the magic of the music. Even you do not know what the music means, but you still can feel the power from the music. And you can still, people will have the uh, sp spiritual spot which we're always missing about that. Also, in developed countries, just the way I show, they have already have a good recycle system. But when you use our cans, people will be interested in our new cans. They will not throw the cans away when they just buy it in Or when they just buy it in a store, that will improve the efficient and the efficient of the recycle system. And why you you should choose our project? I believe there are a lot of perfect project uh, is better than us and which you can choose. Why you, why you need to choose our project? Because when we make this one, we consider, consider about the company. First is the major technology. The gramophone technology is major. That means you do not to pay a lot of money on research and de development. I know today, uh, there are a lot of new technology, just like Tesla. Uh, they use the electricity to 
makes your car runs, but that me that still means this need to pay a lot, a lot more, a lot of my money on to research the battery. battery. In our plan, you do not to need to pay a lot of money because the technology is mature. And second, and it's universalizable. You can see there are a, a many different kinds of cans which use in the whole world. There is a plastic cans, there is a aluminum cans, but our project still can be used on every kind of cans. So it's a global solution. It's uh, if like a, a Coca Cola, if you have a lot of cans products, our product is a good way because you can use it in every cans product can products. Third is incremental value. This uh, this can is can people will be interested in that. People will wonder which music they bought. They will to, they want to buy it, and that means you will get the company will make more money, right? Like Coca Cola, like, like Beer Store. They are companies. They pay sales for people. They they want to make money. They want to. They didn't want to waste money. So, if our project is helping you to make more money and at the same, same time we still get a recycled economy and it's also good for the environment the third enhanced product visibility for example this is a coca-cola spot we can see they have already invent some idea on their product. They try to improve the interest on the products. They try to get a recycle uh, economy. Our product also have the same idea. And I think our idea is better because it's more interesting than the, the the uh, uh, selfish of one. And last thing, the low cost. Our design is not change the purpose or shape of the product itself. And also cans every day, they make billions of cans and selling billions of cans. When you buy a new equipment to cast the music on the surface, the cost of the equipment will separate over billions of cans. So it's, it's not a lot of money. So you will get a low cost. Overall, you can see our product. We just change a little bit of about our cans. Your company do not need to pay a lot of money and uh, you will get a really, really good idea. People will remember this idea and the environment will be uh, get better. People want and people will want, they want to collect and keep the aluminum cans. When they get this empty cans back, these cans, will go back to the recycle system. Uh, so the country's recycle system will improve and get more efficiency. And in Africa or some, some place who, who do not have electricity, they still can use these cans to hear the music rather than throw it in the ocean or just throw it in the street. So thank you. This is our project. And this is our plan. Thanks very much, Hugh. Uh, oh, very sorry. good presentation.
Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if uh, everybody noticed, but uh, our friend Lawrence had to step out. But what we'll do now is um, we'll open it up to the judges for any questions, and then we'll we'll convene as a judging team separately, um, and then um, we'll let uh, Maha entertain you with all kinds of things about circular economy because she, she's our resident expert. So, uh, Akash, any questions for uh, you and uh, his group? Um. I want to, uh, firstly, I want to say that it's a very interesting project. Uh, I read your brief very uh, before before this and uh, I found it very engaging. Um, it's uh, it, like the heart is in the right place. It it's addresses a very uh, developing country issue. So the question I had was about the economy and the cost of these things. Um, have you Have you had a chance to have a look at any uh, big will trying to put or engrave songs on a can would require a higher thickness of the aluminium because I, what, what, from what I've seen, aluminium cans are really, really thin. Like they are the bare minimum. Would And would that increase in thickness affect the economy of cans? Like a company like Coca-Cola, for instance, makes millions of cans a year, and even a 0.1 millimeter thick increase in thickness would affect their bottom lines. Um, is like, have you have you put a thought to it? Oh, uh, actually, oh, I I didn't do a more search about how to cut uh, the growth on the aluminum cans, uh, and about the cost, uh, I thought. I, I, my idea is just like a laser thing because it's much uh, accuracy and it's easy to cut on the aluminum cans. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, just think about it. Like Coca-Cola, they sell the cans, billions uh, of cans one day. If just this equipment cost one billion, you th their, their each cost of cans just with one dollar. I know that, that that's not a good example, but that's the meaning. Yeah. 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 So, no, and I agree. I agree with you that it's uh, like the, the whole concept of circular economy is it, it needs a change in mindset as well as the technology. So the the increase in cost has to be has to be factored in Cokes and there had there's a benefit somewhere else. Um, but my my point was it has to be factored in. So we we need to know how much more material we are using. We need to know how much more, um, like in terms of cost, how much that's going to increase, and then that needs to be offset somewhere else. So good job. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, going along with uh, Akash's uh, thinking. So the technology to in, engrave or to the, it's like it's like making albums, the plastic albums. They used to um, prove out the plastic to, with the songs. So there is some there is some requirements <clears throat> or some technology there that does it already. So how would that technology be? You know, using plastics versus now using aluminum. So that technology has to be kind of kind of similar to what you're doing now and creating those uh, <clears throat> those grooves on those uh, on those cans. So is that something that I guess that's what you would uh, using that same technology? But may, you mentioned you would use lasers. <clears throat> and again, the, the the cost of doing that and having that uh, technology adapted to us uh, their cylinder. That that's probably a, another factor in terms of economics about this product. I mean, it does it does it. It, it is circular. I mean, I think it's uh, it's very clear that you're you're going to increase uh, recyclability. You're going to increase improve the environment. Uh, those things, those things are all very clear. What based on the intent of the project. Uh, so, anyways, so just want. Um, uh, how do you uh, how do you uh, see that working, or how is that technology going to be uh, implemented? 
Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, how about my te technology? What? What? Like, how do you how do you envision the the, the technology behind engraving the, the cans with uh, uh, with the music and, and the grooves? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the technology about uh, how to cut uh, in, in on the old cans. For me, it's a still problem. It's also a problem I mean, I just think about laser because I'm not really familiar with how to uh, cut uh, metals and uh, other things. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I, because of both the cans, so the cost, I think, is even that equipment or you just build the equipment is expensive, but uh, you can still control the cost. So I, 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 I uh, that is my idea. Yes, uh, sorry about that. I'm no, no, really not don't, don't be sorry know about the okay. technology. Okay. I mean, it's very innovative. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really thinking out of the box a lot. Um, and, and it, it does show that you're moving, like it's, you're trying to improve recyclability in, in the environment and, uh, and making another, uh, something that you already have, making something else you, make, make more useful. So. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'll jump in now with uh, uh, my two cents. Um, the thing I like about what's going on here is it's very similar to an engineer that Dan knows quite well, Dr. Norbert Becker, where he goes over to China and helps third world countries build uh, um, uh, wells because they don't have any fresh water. Uh, I think it was China. Was was that his last adventure, Dan? Yeah, I think so. I think he, yeah. he was in China for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, he was also in, uh, he was in um, Haiti too, I think. I think so. Yeah. So I like the, the project and I'm not trying to critique the project right now. I'm getting to <laughs> my question, but uh, it's just the fact that you're trying to help a third world country, countries that have very little. We're, 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 we're blessed in Canada to have uh, a lot of unique things and, and resources. But one of the questions that hit my head uh, and it's related to what Akash and, and, and Dan was talking about was, you need to approach companies like Coca-Cola to implement your technology in the engraving technology. So first off, of course, as you know, you need to develop that engraving technology and that's fine. We don't expect a completely, uh, a completely finished product here in today's ex uh, exercise. But uh, how do you think you're going to be able to convince a company like Coca-Cola or a Pepsi to do extra work? Like Akash pointed out, the, th the metal thickness, that might be a problem, yes, but just the fact that you want to engrave a can, how are you going to convince them to do that? Uh, it's very easy. Uh, just uh, I showed in my PowerPoint, you can see Coca-Cola has already tried to improve the products. They try to get uh, more things on the bottles to, uh, to use. Uh, may I share my screen? Yes. Uh, like these three pictures, that's Coca-Cola duels. So we can see they have already tried other ideas to improve the bottles. And I, I believe they also try to improve the cans. So it's like the similar idea to they have already, already done. I just give them a different uh, idea to, uh, about the cans. And also, just I said, people will people like th this idea, and they will buy it. They will pay more money to buy these things, uh, even they it's not useful. That will help the company like Coca Cola to make more money. And also, uh, they just need pay. I think uh, pay a little money or a little. Uh, research and they will get a really really good famous uh, things uh, like Coca-Cola is care about the environment uh, 
they try to improve the efficiency of the recycle system and they are help the third country's people. Uh, so I think they will be very happy to try my product. Yeah. I, I agree that you have to look at the money side and whether you want to charge the consumer more, you may or may not be able to, <laughs> you may or may not be able to convince the consumer. But one thing uh, as a future engineer you need to look at is, is there possibilities of in, uh, getting the government to look at tax incentives and stuff like that to encourage companies like Coke and Pepsi to, to do something for other countries. So, so I think you're in the right direction. So anyways, uh, let's, uh, I'm just looking at the clock here. So let, let me see if I can figure out how to get Akash and Dan and I in a separate room. Um, and then feel free to talk more with, uh, with Maha about your idea. I don't think we'll be very long. Okay. Uh, hey, very good job. Thank you. So, uh, how, what, what made you decide about this project? What, what inspired you to choose this project? Uh, actually, I, I have a little dream about the phonograph because it's, it's, I really want to have one, but it's a little expensive, I think. And, you know, I live in a foreign countries. When I move out, it's, I, it's a little difficult to move. So, uh, just uh, think about that. Uh, one day I just uh, drink uh, cans. I think if that is expensive, maybe I can build one and uh, that will be cheap. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So let me share with you uh, a video about circular economy. Let's go here and then I will share my screen. Living systems have been around for a few billion years and will be around for many more. In the living world, there's no landfill. Instead, materials flow. One species' waste is another's food, energy is provided by the sun, things grow, then die, and nutrients return to the soil safely. And it works. Yet as humans, we've adopted a linear approach. We take, we make, and we dispose. A new phone comes out, so we ditch the old one. Our washing machine packs up, so we buy another. Each time we do this, we're eating into a finite supply of resources and often producing toxic waste. It simply can't work long term. So what can? If we accept that the living world's cyclical model works, can we change our way of thinking so that we too operate a circular economy. Let's start with the biological cycle. How can our waste build capital rather than reduce it? By rethinking and redesigning products and components and the packaging they come in, we can create safe and compostable materials that help grow more stuff. As they say in the movies, no resources have been lost in the making of this material. So what about the washing machines, mobile phones, fridges? We know they don't biodegrade. Here, we're talking about another sort of rethink, a way to cycle valuable metals, polymers, and alloys, so they maintain their quality and continue to be useful beyond the shelf life of individual products. What if the goods of today became the resources of tomorrow? It makes commercial sense. Instead of the throw away and replace culture we've become used to, we'd adopt a return and renew one, where products and components are designed to be disassembled and regenerated. One solution may be to rethink the way we view ownership. What if we never actually owned our technologies? We simply licensed them from the manufacturers. Now, let's put these two cycles together. Imagine if we could design products to come back to their makers, their technical materials being reused and their biological parts increasing agricultural value. And imagine that these products are made and transported using renewable energy. Here we have a model that builds prosperity long term. And the good news is there are already companies out there who are beginning to adopt this way of working. 
that the circular economy isn't about one manufacturer changing one product. It's about all the interconnecting companies that form our infrastructure and economy coming together. It's about energy. It's about rethinking the operating system itself. We have a fantastic opportunity to open new perspectives and new horizons. Instead of remaining trapped in the frustrations of the present, with creativity and innovation, we really can rethink and redesign our future. Okay. Uh, so the judge. Hey, we're back. Are back. Yes. Welcome back. Um, we're back with the the bad news. Sean, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I uh, wanted to apologize with regards to the other teams. They all backed out. We had <laughs> we had a handful of teams. Some never did register properly, and then some others uh, earlier this week backed out. So we talked uh, as judging team. We're saying, what do we do? <laughs> we have some money. We have to give it away. <laughs> so we definitely think your pro project uh, qualifies. And as an engineer, we know it's not going to be perfect when in a concept phase. You're you're at that initial phase. And so you satisfy the criteria. Uh, so we feel we should award you uh, first place. Uh, but what it comes down to is how much do we have in the budget? Well, we have a couple expenses. So we said instead of the the original first place prize of 350, we're going to break it uh, or bring it up to three. Sorry, 450 dollars. Okay. So what we'll have to do afterwards is we'll have to get some contact information from you. And what happens is I'll send a um, a request for payment to Professional Engineers Ontario headquarters, and they'll send you a check directly. So um, let's communicate with you directly later to get a. Um, uh, I think what they need is an address and all that stuff, but we'll, we'll talk about that afterwards, okay? But anyways, congratulations. congratulations. Uh, did a great job in a very short period of time, and uh, you look professional. Um, and, and we realize English is your second language, but that's okay. We're not judging that part. You did a very good job of presenting your, your idea and uh, the potential of it working um, based on circular economy um, principles. So, good. Yeah. Anything else, Maha? Just want to wanna share, if you want to, to reach us or you have any questions, please feel free to send an email to um, uh, this email, uh, namchallenge at PO Windsor Essex. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, for participating. Thank you for the, judge, the judges that uh, uh, came and uh, volunteered their uh, time to uh, to be part of this competition and this challenge was uh, interesting that the speaker was uh, uh, informative and we got lots of uh, knowledge about the recycling especially in in the plastic industry uh, also we would like to thank our uh, partners here we would love to to uh, participate more and we're it's just like the first year we're uh, building the idea of circular economy we would love to to join us next year with uh, an improved design and uh, um, for sure we'll, we'll, we'll get great ideas from other students thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful day yep. thank you. John, anything you want to add no as I said hey we'll be in touch with you uh... Uh, with regards to getting your contact information afterwards. But thanks to everybody. I appreciate your time and patience. Okay, so everybody thanks, have a great Dan. Saturday evening. Thank you. you thanks, too. Dan and Akash. Yep. And yeah. have, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Care.